My name is Boris. I work, I'm a software engineer at Code Synthesis, where we develop open source tools and libraries for C++. And one of our latest projects is the build system for C++, which is the topic of today's talk. Now, build systems have kind of a religious undertone, especially in C++. So some of you might be wondering, you know, who is this guy to talk to me about build systems? So let me just give you a, a bit of background. Um, I contributed a few features to GNUMEC. Uh, I've done a couple of open heart surgeries on pattern matching rule code there. I don't know if, you, if you're familiar, if you've used GNUMEC in some advanced ways, uh, second expansion and pattern rules was the feature that I implemented. Uh, and the reason I started doing that was because I was developing my own non-recursive build system called build using NuMake. And that required you know, some ex in extensions to NuMake. I, I just couldn't do some certain things. Uh, and that, so I've been doing that for past 10 years. And that build system was is actually pretty successful internally. Um, it's used in XSD and ODB. Some of you m may have heard uh, of these projects or products uh, at Code Synthesis. Now, those of you who've used them, if any, you probably never heard of build, though. And the reason for that is because build is what I would call uh, a developer-oriented build system as opposed to a distribution-oriented build system. When it's time to make a release, for example, for ODB, we use build to automatically generate Visual Studio projects and automate, you know, make files and other conf scripts, which is what the end user sees in the distribution. J but just to give you an idea of, of the, you know, kind of developer side capabilities of build, uh, for ODB, which is an object relational mapping system, on this laptop I have five databases, I have six compiler, Ver slash versions, you know, I have Clang, GCC, a couple of versions of this. We support both C++ 98 and 11, so we need to test both. And just to throw a couple of more combinations, we have Q4 and 5 to test. So that gives us 120 configurations. Uh, well, I'm not claiming I, I have all of them on this laptop, but I have about 30, and they're all built from the same source code, from, from the same s source tree. So, you know, it might sound that, you know, what's the problem then? You know, sounds like build addresses all our needs. And there are a couple of them, so let me just list them. First one is uh, what I would call thick make files. And rather than explain, I'll just show you. So this is a make file for a Hello World example. So it's probably three pages, good three pages, long, dense, kind of make language. Now, there's nothing really, you know, internally wrong with that. If, you, if you're going to study it, it all kind of make, will make sense eventually. It's pretty declarative. But, you know, there's a lot of boilerplate code. It's like writing, you know, programs on a, in assembler. So we don't want to do that. The other problem is uh, also funny name, Heri Distributions. Again, I'll just show you what I mean. So remember, I mentioned that build is used to automatically generate Visual Studio projects, other tools projects. And this is a distribution for the same hello example. And it has a couple of source files, you know, kind of the meat of the example. It's pretty simple. Oh, I have to use less so you know it's not going to look pretty. <laughs> so, you know, you see those two files at the top, and the rest is basically. Visual Studio project for different databases for different versions. And this is only going to get worse uh, because, you know, Microsoft now releases a new version of Visual Studio every year. So, so the, the only way to, the only kind of sure way to fix this is would be the second problem, the hairy distribution, is to use a unified build system. And it's not going to be easy to do with build because it's fairly Linux centric. Well, GNUMake itself is, you know, Linux or more generally Unix-centric. Yes, it's been ported to uh, Windows, but, you know, if you had tried, you know, you don't want to use it on Windows. Let's put it that way. So that's the problem. What's the goal then? And the goal is actually not the build system uh, itself. The goal is actually a package manager for C++. 
uh, source manager so that we be able to do something like this. Uh, I'm sure those of you familiar with Linux, with apt-get or yum will see the similarity. It's a little bit different, but you can get the idea. And the goal is also to be able to type it pretty much exa exactly the same, you know, where and get exactly the same result without having to, you know, do a lot of extra installations. So the idea is a cross-platform package manager and a central repository of open source C++ libraries. Actually, this is not the, the end goal. The end goal is this. Um, so, well, you may be using a different ID or no ID, but you, you can get the idea. All I want to do, all I want my users to do is to type the library name in a single field, you know, additional dependencies or link to libraries or whatever it's called. And that's it. You know, they don't need to worry about where do I get it? Do I need to download it? Do I need, what do I need to do to build it? And more importantly, how do I build it so that it matches my project configurations? Right? You know, I need a debug, 64-bit, and I'm using this funny runtime, you know, non-standard runtime. How do I build this dependency of mine to match that? So this is all can be done by, by an integration between a, a, an IDE and a package manager. Now, Visual Studio knows exactly the configuration of the project to which you want to link this library. So it can call the package manager, provide the exact configuration the pack and the package name or library name. Package manager downloads it, builds it for this exact configuration, and returns the result to Visual Studio. That's it. You know, the user, the end user completely removed from all those error-prone steps of making sure that he gets the exact build that he wants to use in his project. So that's the ultimate goal. I mean, obviously, this is a lot more difficult than uh, this, and the main problems won't be technical, but you know, worth a try, right? So how do we get them? And um, might sound surprising, but I actually find NuMake, make or NuMake, um, the most sane build system from all of them, from all of them. And to paraphrase a famous quote, you know, those who don't understand make. Uh, uh, condemned to reinvent it poorly. So let's reinvent it properly then. And the problem with Make is it's been designed you know, 30 years ago to build sim simple Unix utilities. And for that it works pretty well for simple stuff. The problem is that, well, for the past 20 years what's been happening in Make uh, development in general, but in GNU Make specifically, you know, we're trying to stretch this a uh, simple model to cover ever more complex projects. And you know, that, that doesn't work. You know, I've tried it myself, and you've seen the make file, the, the result. So to put it this way, um, if make is CBS, you know, they're kind of the same age, don't you want to know what a Git equivalent of a, of a build system would look like? Now, We all have our favorite build systems. I'm sure most of you are using CMake at this stage. Uh, and I'm not here to convince you that my stuff is better, well, yet. Uh, rather, I want to show you how things can be different and see what you think. So I'll just show a ton of examples just in th with, a, with an aim to give you kind of an intuitive feel for what this is about. So I hope that's OK. And one more thing, um, you know what I hate the most uh, in software development in general and in build systems in particular? They're really bad at that. Magic. You know, when you have to put this thing, you don't even know, you know what to call it, at, after this line, and, and this, this will work, and you shouldn't ask any questions. <laughs> so uh, if you see any, you think there's some magic in the examples that I show you, I actually want you to ask questions. So we will have no magic. All right. So let's dive in. Our first example, hello world traditionally. I'm not going to show the source file. I'm sure you, most of you can come up with the contents. Um, let me mention the name of this new build system. So the old one I, I mentioned called build. So you know this one is called build2, as in build take2. So similar to make, we'll call the file build file. Luckily, nobody seems to be using this name. Um, so this is 
the contents of our project. So we have the source file and the build file. This is uh, the contents of the build file, but don't, don't worry about it too much now, just two lines. We're going to look at it line by line in the next slide, but for now let's just go to the terminal and see if it actually does something sensible. So I mentioned the tool is called build2, but that's actually quite long to type and for me personally make, especially if you type make minus j22, that's, that's a bit long to type. So we thought, oh, I should call it BLD or maybe BD and then kind of decided, let's be bold and call it B. So <laughs> it's called B. So there we run it. Um, just, just a quick note, license under MIT license or open source permissive license. Feel free to hack and reuse. All right, so traditionally, if you want to update the project, bring everything up to date, you just run the tool without any options, arguments. So let's try that. Screen is a bit messing me up. Can you figure it out? Thanks. OK, I'll ask you to ignore this, uh, this G++ line for now. This one bit of magic, but it's temporary. I'm going to explain what it means later. There is, looks you know, more or less sensible, right? Compiled something that looks like a source file and link the executable. So let's take a look if it actually did produce something. So it looks like we have an executable. Can even run it. Let's try to run it again. Uh, we should just move the projector. <laughs> um, so the message is a bit cryptic. So it says info dir is already up to date. So dir is a bit looks a bit weird, but there is also kind of makes sense, right? We just updated our project, didn't change anything, so it says everything is up to date. So if we want to remove everything that we've built, traditionally we use something like clean. So let's try that. You now we're just kind of going with the flow and trying what makes sense. Okay, so those are ours. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's better. Thank you very much. Awesome. <laughs> okay, ignoring the first line and seems to be doing the sensible thing again. Now, if we want to see what's actually being executed underneath, we can turn on the verbose mode. There we see the actual command lines that's being executed. So we, it's using G. G GCC by default. So I can do the same for clean, see a bit more output. Uh, now, if you want to see really a lot of stuff, you can crank up the le verbosity level to five, and then you'll see quite a bit of kind of internals, what's going on inside, but useful for understanding, you know, when, s when things don't go as you thought they should, it could be quite useful. All right, so that's our kind of first session. Let's take a look at the build file, two lines. Um, first line, I think you can kind of guess what's going on here. We're kind of loading some C++ subsystem. And in build terms, we are loading a C++ module, so support for compiling C++ source code and linking it. Second line, a little bit interesting, more interesting, but those of you who are familiar with make or similar build system can probably also guess what's going on here. Right? We have an executable target on the left and we have a prerequisite on the right. Now a couple of differences compared to make. I'll, I'll use references to make quite a bit. I think more, all of you kind of have a, at least basic understanding what's going on. A um, couple of differences. Well, in make, both of them will be targets. You know, on the left hand side you have a target, on the right hand side you have a prerequisite which are also targets. And that turned out to be a really bad idea. Uh, and you will have hacks like vpath to work around them in make. 
So in build, we say that on the left you still have targets, but on the right it's actually a prerequisite. It's a, it's a separate entity, which later is resolved to targets in some interesting ways, into which I'm not going to go into detail. Okay, I think I have a question. Yes? So um, you have the CXX with hello, and I'm guessing that uh, finds would match any file with a C++-like extension? Okay, so the question was this CXX, hello, uh, the guess is that it will match any uh, file with CXX extension. Well, I'm actually getting right into that. Okay. So I think I hope, but I'm going to then explain, uh, give, give the answer to your question. So yeah, the other kind of weird thing uh, that those EXZ and CXX and those curly braces. So traditionally, we use file extensions to kind of determine what kind of file it is. This also turned out to be a really bad idea. Uh, firstly, you have different extensions and different platforms. OBG on Windows, .o on, we on Windows, a good example. Um, another nasty kind of problem if you're doing this way on, on, on Unix, uh, there's no extension for executables. Makes it really painful to write pattern rules in Make to kind of hook to that. So in build, we say, you know, we have explicit target and prerequisite types, which are, you know, you specify as executable and source file. So now going back to your question, you could have actually said hello.cxx or cpp or cc capital. Uh, the idea is that you can actually configure default extension for your project. So you can say my C++ source files are named .cpp. So, and then you don't have to keep repeating, you know, it's a C++ file with extension CPP. Okay, so if you just wrote that, then, and you had a file called hello.cpp, would that work or not? Right now. Okay. Well, the idea is that y you have a file dot called dot hello.cpp, and you have a project setting, which I'll show later, which says my projects in this, my, fi my C++ source files in this project have extension CPP by default, and then you don't need to write CPP. Okay, so then you only have one default, and you have to specify anything that doesn't match that default? Uh, let's me, let me put it this way. This hasn't been implemented yet, so. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, repeat the question. So the question is, you know, if we have a, what, is it one default extension per project, or I assume the, the kind of the second part of the question, can you specify several, and then it searches for them, you can do that. Okay. Okay. It's, a, it's possible. If, if we realize that sensible thing to do, we'll do it. You know, in uh, kind of the, 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 the over, overall point is that in GNU Make, you would never even think about doing something like this. And now all of a sudden, oh, look, maybe, you know, if I have different extensions, maybe it makes sense to kind of look for, for several of them. And could be could be a reasonable thing to do. But, you know, we have a much bigger fish to fry, let me put it this way. So this is kind of details. All right. Um, let's talk about that clean. Uh, we kind of typed it and it did the right thing, but what is clean exactly? You know, if in, in, ma in the make file, it would be a target, right? But we haven't really ma have any mentioning of clean in our build file. So what exactly is clean? And in build, clean is an operation. And the default operation is update. So when we run B, it's actually equivalent to running B update. Okay, so you get exactly the same message. And when was the last time you've so I ran clean twice. So the first time it removed everything, and the second time it just said, you know, everything is clean. When was the last time you've seen a build system that told you that, you know, your, your directory is already clean? How did it know it was already clean? Well, the question is, how did it know that it's already clean? Well, it actually tried to clean it, and so it didn't do anything. So it said it's already clean. So. But kind of the point, I'm well, of the underlying point I'm trying to make is that once you get you know, the model right, or you think about it, and things like that, you know, nasty, uh, 
nice things like that, they kind of come naturally. And I didn't have to do anything special for it. Just kind of happened. And I thought, oh, cool. All right, so clean is operation, not a target. And defo by default, when you don't specify an operation, it's update. Um, I'm not going to talk about, um, I'm going to talk about operations a bit in more detail a bit later, exactly what it means, but just to give you a heads up. Um, so if it's an operation, you know, in, in the make, you kind of don't really often say, see something like make clean all, because that, that usually will break something in a bad way. But you know, we have operations, can we say several of them, type, you know, run several of them at once? You know, why not? Let's try. So this is actually quite a useful sequence, you know, basically rebuild, right? If you want to make sure everything recompiles for whatever reason. Another interesting one is clean update clean, right? So we, we are not interested in the result of the compilation. We just want to make sure everything compiles. So that's also quite interesting. All right, um, so let's get stock of our, you know, magic bits uh, operations. I'm going to explain later that this G++ line and that dir in dir already up to date message. So these things I kind of said that I'm going to explain later. Let's focus on the last line. And to illustrate kind of the underlying idea, we're going to develop version two of our hello library. And here we factor the hello saying code into some utility file. Again, I'm not going to show any of it. And we also add a test to test it. So this is our build file. Again, we're going to take a look at it in more detail on a separate slide. First line, we've already seen. The second line, I think, again, most of you can guess what's going on I, here. I'm, I want to use C++11, so I set the standard in a compiler-independent way. The, la the last two lines pretty similar to the previous one. Uh, you know, now we have a test and a hello example, and we just added a utility file to it. Let me just take a little digression and talk about names. Uh, if you look in GNU make source code, I don't know how many of you looked inside, uh, it's actually a giant string chopping and splicing machine. Basically, 90% of the time what it does is like finding the end of or this character in a string and splitting it this way or that way. And if you think about it, in build systems, most of the time what we deal with is are names or lists of names more often. And be it a file, a target, a prerequisite. So in build, we kind of turn it around and say, you know, by default, we're dealing with names, not strings. And the uh, representation of a name in build kind of internal, I'm simplifying a little bit, it has three parts, two optionals. So that's a type, we've already seen it, executable or source file. It has a directory, so basically location of this name can make sense for certain, some of them. Finally, the required part is the name value itself. When all these three components are specified, you get the, this uh, syntax that we use in the build file. So it's directory, slash, and then type, and curly braces. A value, so we, we've seen examples when the directory was omitted. Once you're going to make this first step, it becomes kind of very natural to also want to have nice syntax for capturing name literals in your build files, and especially lists of name literals. So think of them as C++ initializer lists, but which are not broken. Okay? So here, a couple of examples. So we have two simple names. We have uh, the same as before. Can, you can kind of put extra curly braces around names and nothing will happen. It's kind of all removed. So here we have an executable type uh, name foo, uh, which is of type executable. Now here we have two names, both executable, so we don't have to repeat the type twice. Now we have uh, a name foo in the directory baz and exactly the same as before, so we can add curly braces. Now we have two names, foo and bar in the directory bass, and now we have two names, 
both executables, both in directory bus. Now, the last two examples are a bit more interesting. You can say, you know, two names in the directory bus, and one of them is executable, so you can, can kind of add the type later. Or you can turn it around and say both of them are executables, and the last one is in directory bus. Question, yes? Uh, no, good point. Oh, sorry. The last the question was in the last examples. Do do in the in the last example do we need curly brace? And the answer is no. You don't need to. Good good catch. All right. So with this knowledge, we can kind of shorten our build file a little bit, right? We can we don't need to repeat repeat this uh, target type twice. Okay. Um, Let's go take a look how it all works. So second version of our is the contents. Okay, let's just build it. Okay, so I don't know if you noticed one th one thing kind of immediately stands out is that we only built one executable, the first one, the first one. We probably want to build both of them by default. What if can we specify a target on the command line that we want to build? Well, let's give it a shot. All right, so we can. What about specifying several of them? Also works well. They're both up to date, but if they weren't, it would be updated. Let's start clean. Oh, yes. Question. Oh, sorry. Qu Are question. Ah, uh, yeah. Sorry. The question was, can you just clean one of them? And the answer is yes. I'll go, I'm going to show you now. Mm, well, if you run just clean by default, it kind of does the same what update does, you know, it cleans the first executable and everything that's kind of related to it, but not the second. Again, something that we probably don't want. Um, clean, clean one of them. Well, clean as an operation, so kind of, what do you think, can we maybe pass a target as an argument, an operation? Let's give it a shot. So that un answers your question. Works. Can path pass several targets to an operation. Well, both of them are clean. All right. But yeah, we have a bit of a problem, and that is, you know, we want to build both of them by default and clean both of them by default, but we're only building first one. And, you know, this is the default target kind of issue problem. And those of you who use make know that's a bit, it's been a big mess there. So I worked quite hard not to repeat it. So what, let's, let's think, what are we building here? You know, the kind of the first answer that comes to, you know, mind, well, we are building these two targets, but that's not very elegant. It's not easy to kind of refer to them from other build files. What if we have like 10 or 20 ta default targets? So I would say what we are building here is actually a directory. You know, we have a bunch of sources in the directory. We have a build file that builds some targets in this directory. So when we say build inside this directory, what we are building is this directory, right? Some set of default targets in this directory. So in build, it's, the rule is actually very simple. Uh, the default target is always the current directory. So it's basically the directory where you are building. And if, if you don't have this explicit uh, current directory target, then one is automatically added. Think of it as a default constructor automatically generated. And the first target that you mention in your build file is automatically made a prerequisite of this target. So that's, that's how you get the behavior that, uh, you know, in, the first, in, the first, in our first version, we didn't even think about it because we only had one target. In the second version, um, of our build system that explains what happened, right? An implicit one was added, dependency on the first target, and that's what's been built. 
this is also this also hopefully explains or kind of gives you an idea what this dir means there. So you know if the default target is a current directory, so that would explain what it means, and it kind of makes sense, right? You you ran build in the directory and it tells you well the directory is up to date, which kind of or it's clean, which kind of fits nicely. All right, so um, let's see how we specify directories in the build file, because this is a fairly uh, commonly used, will be a fairly commonly used um, type of target. There's a little bit extra syntactic sugar for, for it in the build built-in. So the, direct, the target type is dir, and these are three ways to kind of specify the same target, pick your, the one you like. So this third one is, is that special syntactic sugar. So anything basically that ends with a forward slash is treated as a directory. And this is uh, five ways to specify, uh, admittedly a bit too many for my liking, but you know, it's, they kind of flow naturally. I didn't do anything for them, especially, except for this dot. Um, so this is the, sp the specification of current directory, kind of all makes sense. Maybe the first one is a bit confusing, but if you think about it, you know, it's a empty directory, empty directory name in the current directory, which kind of means the current directory, right? I personally like the last probably because it's the least to type. So this is our file, but fixed this time. We just add this line, default current directory target, pre two prerequisites, both our executables. Let's see if it actually works. All right, now it builds everything. And if we clean, it cleans everything. And if we clean again, we get this message, which I hope now makes sense. It tells you that tells us the current directory is clean. Questions? No? Clear? You obviously chose to pick just the first one by default and require somebody to expressly say, I want all of these to be the, the uh, targets for the directory. Why did you opt for that rather than saying, you know what, by default, every one of these EXEs or you know, all the targets get built, and if you only want a subset, then add special syntax for that. So the question was, uh, you know, I kind of selected this default current directory target, and it only builds a set, a subset of, you know, by default, it only builds the first one, but why not build everything, right, or every target in the build file? I guess you could do that. I'm just not sure it's exactly the semantics you would. Maybe a bit surprising, I don't know. Well, you but, say but you're building the directory. Right. So all of those targets are in the build mm. file for that directory. So to me, it kind of makes sense that the default be everything. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can see the reasoning for that. But I, I think there, is, there could be. Uh, I can kind of see situations where it might not end up doing what you expect. Like, for example, you might have, uh, you express a dependency. You know, let's say an object file on a source file, but this object file, let's say, is not used in this build because it's, say, position independent. You know, it's used for shared library, but we are not building the shared library in, in this configuration. But you still want to capture, for example, this non-standard dependency in your build file. So that would be a target, and in your model it would be built, even and, and it will be completely unnecessary. So I don't know if it makes yeah, sense. Syntax that would allow you to omit it by default. You mean using this? Yes. True. I guess I suppose it could be. Yeah, I think I'll think about it. Interesting idea. Okay. Uh, I don't know who was first. Okay. Do you, do you build the, the dark and different dependencies? Yeah. Oh, sorry. The uh, the question was, do I build a DAG or direct acyclic graph of dependencies? Yes, the answer is yes. If you have a DAG, you can know what are your um, you know, the dependencies that are you can know what are your Mm. 
It is part of the deck. No, it's not part of the value. You're saying it was not part of the build, right? Yeah, but the, the dependency is still captured. You know, I, I said this object file depends on this special source file, not, not kind of the default derivation. I'm going to repeat this kind of whole. Sum I'll summarize it. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Does it make sense? It's part of the DAG. It's kind of an island, you know. It's not used in this. In it, you know, DAG is kind of ca captures okay. all the so dependency. It's a target, uh, if, when it's a target on itself. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. So all right. So. It was part of an library that didn't, that didn't go to. No. It didn't go to build. Okay. Yeah. So just to summarize a little bit of confusion. So what I meant is that it's still part of the. This, this kind of special object file dependency that I wanted to capture, it's still part of the, of the internal graph, dependency graph, but it's just not used in this configuration. But it's still loaded. Or it might not be used in this particular build or in, in the execution of this particular command, uh, operation. Yeah, OK, let's go. Um, all right, let's take stock of our things to be explained. Still operations and test G++ line. Let's focus on this test G++ line. I'll have to cover quite a bit of, kind of background for that. But just to give you an idea, it has to do with configuration, which I think is a quite interesting topic. But before we talk about configurations, let's talk about projects. In build, there's an, an explicit notion of a project. And there are two kinds. One is simple project, which is what we've been using up till now. They have a single build file, usually one directory. but can have subdirectories. And the biggest limitation of simple uh, projects is that there is no out of three builds. And then there are real projects which uh, support multiple directories, multiple build files, out of three builds, project wide settings, uh, which is where you would put those extensions that we talked about earlier, uh, support for project dependencies, so import, export, and sub projects and amalgamation. So sometimes you might want to bundle some dependency with your project. So there's support for that. So let's convert. Um, yeah, let's convert our, uh, um, develop our version 3 of our hello library. And we will just make it a real project. We put everything into subdirectories and becoming cluttered, especially if you have multiple tests. So we have a hello uh, subdirectory where we put uh, application in the utility and a separate directory for tests. Now, in build, there's kind of two fundamental no values that describe a project. And that's a project root and project base. Well, the root is kind of obvious, right? It's a root directory of the project. And the base is basically a directory inside the project where we are currently building. So if we are building inside hello, you know, a building application, then the base will point to hello. And if we are building a test, then the project base will be test. Well, it's not actually two values, it's four values. I lied uh, because they're out of three builds. So here we have a source tree build and we have a output build tree, right? Kind of parallel. So what we have a really is, is four value sets or variables. They are variables set maintained automatically by build. Um, so called source root, source base, and out root, out base. It's kind of another view of it. This time we are using test as an example, test subdirectory. So source root would point to this directory, source base point to test, out root point to the root directory here, and out base to test here. As you can see, these two suffixes will always be the same. All right. So how does build find where the project root? How does it know where the project is, the, the project root directory is? And the way it does it by looking for a special directory, I guess it named called build. Uh, that contains a couple of special files. First of one is bootstrap. Uh, as the name suggests, this is the first file that is loaded when the project dependencies are loaded. And the second file is a root build file, which is a project-wide settings. Why do we have two files? It's a good question, but I cannot explain it right now, but I will a bit later. All right, let's take a look at the bootstrap and root build files for our uh, our hello project. Bootstrap is very simple. We just specify the project name. And uh, root build, all our source is C++. You know, all our build files build C++, and we use C++ 11. So it makes sense to kind of make it a project-wide 
setting, right? We load the module in the root build file once and set the standard. So we don't have to repeat ourselves. Let's take a look at the build file in the hello directory. Pretty simple. Now that we don't have to mess with loading the module and setting the standard, it becomes one liner, which is the way I like to keep them. And the build file in the test uh, example in the test directory is pretty much the same. Here we use a relative path to get the utility source file from the hello subdirectory. Right, let's go take a look. Okay, let me just show you the source tree again. It's exactly the same like we had. Okay, so that works. So I went to the hello subdirectory and I built the application. All makes sense. And now I'm gonna go to test and try to build them. All right, something didn't go well. Notice the nice kind of uh, a stack trace that built prints for you. It basically tells you ex exactly what it's trying to update, kind of the chain of updates that triggered the error. Let me rerun it one more time, this time with in the verbose mode. I think you can guess what, what's wrong here, right? We, uh, we include utility in quotes, but there's no utility file in, in this directory. It's in the hello directory, and we also don't have any dash i preprocessor options to help us with that. Okay, so that, that's kind of where the problem is, right, in the test. How do we fix it? A couple of ways. Who likes this way? <laughs> you do. Yeah. I have a colleague who um, this is a bit better. So the idea is to add the dash i option, the required dash i option. And the way we do it is to add it to the preprocessor options. So this is P options stands for preprocessor options. You can probably guess there is also C options and L options. We'll see some of them later. But I actually like to do it a bit different. I, I like to include public headers like this uh, with a directory prefix and using bracket includes everywhere. So I would include it like that in the hello CXX and in test CXX. And then I'll add this dash I option <coughs> in the root build file, so I don't have to repeat it everywhere. So that's how I would fix it. And let's go take a look if it actually helped. So I'll go straight to test and run build there. Okay. Just to verify, let's there's our dash i option. All right, so we, we covered the subdirectory build files. We'll build two executables. What about the root build file? Th these are normally called directory build files because all it does is basically build subdirectories. It's quite kind of common thing. And this is how you do it in build. So you put this thing and it does everything. Right? Magic alert. Okay, let's try again. This is how you actually do it. Um, let's take a look. It's a bit longer. Three lines instead of one, but it doesn't have any magic spells in it. Okay, the first line we just assign a, a variable, the, the subdirectories that we want to build. We don't want to repeat it. If you don't mind repeating it, you can turn it into a two-liner. Next line probably makes sense by now. Current a default directory, which is current directory, depends on building these two subdirectories. And the last line, we haven't seen that before, we include the dependency information from those subdirectories. Right? 
current director at that point, that was hello build file. Right? This is Yeah, this is a root root build file in the hello subdirectory. It's in the hello okay, I thought this was the you know. uh, the root dot build file. No no no. This is yeah, it's it's a root project root build file. Yeah, a bit confusing, I agree. Okay. take a look if that works all right so let me just clean everything so that we can see so now it builds both executables as you can see another interesting thing to notice if you clean then everything is cleaned in the exactly reverse order of building again kind of a little nice thing that you get for free Okay. That seems like a situation where something like C makes add subdirectory makes sense because in one invocation you give the list of the subdirectories and it does everything else that's needed as a consequence. <coughs> Magic, I suppose, but um, right. less verbose. You mean like one line rather than two lines? Or the three, three lines. lines. In your case, yeah. Repeat what I said. Yeah. Uh, the point was maybe it makes sense to have some magic here so it's a one line instead of three. You know, I would personally keep it three lines because, um, you know, this is a trivial example, kind of a little bit more interesting example when you include certain directories sometimes. You know, that's kind of the whole one line idea kind of starts breaking apart, right? You still need a variable, probably an if condition somewhere, but maybe. Well, if I may, you yep. had to do two things. You had to make a dependency on the dot target, yep. and you had to include right. those subdirectories. So you needed to do two operations, mm. and you have to do those two operations every time you want to Im implicitly build subdirectories. Right. That seems like a fundamental uh, feature of a build system that ought to be handled more elegantly. I don't know. I, I don't see, to me, I would rather see, you know, kind of building blocks, two building blocks that, uh, you know, make sense than one thing that I kind of need to know, okay, this thing does the right thing for me. Well, if there's a case where you include but don't have it in the dot target, then it's worth splitting it. If it's always mm. Perl, then it's one feature. Repeat. So the, the point was that if, if there is a case when you include something that is not in the default target, then it would make sense to split it. Could be. One example for that would be my subdirectories contain, let's say every, every, every subdirectory contains a main executable and a few test executables, and I have three subdirectories. And the, when I build from the root, I just <coughs> want to build the executables and not for example, and I would include the subdirectories, but the, my dot would depend not on the directories, but on the directories and yeah. the executables inside. Yeah, you can have a, like a command line variable sales, you know, not tests. It, it just to me, look, may, may, it, it's possible that you are right, and you know, we will realize with experience that you know it's just it's been done so many times that you just need to have a kind of a built-in mechanism for that. But to me, it feels like, you know, we're just painting ourselves into a magic corner. Yes, question? What makes include different than the dependency thing? Like why, like why do you need two separate? Well, what, what here, here well, the question was, wh what separates these two operations? You know, and here we kind of declared a, a, a default target is current directory and here we loaded the dependency well i'm going to talk about include in more detail now maybe it will make sense let's see okay um all right yeah include jumping right in i said that it is oh question sorry yeah is uh does this support um user-defined functions so that 
if I'm always doing both of those steps together, I can write a function and just call that function of mine? Uh, not at the moment, but uh, the question was, does it support user-defined functions? And the answer is uh, no, it doesn't. And I will be very reluctant to add them because I want to keep it as declarative as possible. But again, you know, if with experience we learn that that's the right thing to support, we will do it. You know, the make experience kind of taught me personally that trying to, you know, retrofit a programming language into a declarative one is not going to end up well. Okay. All right. Um, let's talk about this include. I said that we kind of load dependencies, right? But what exactly do I mean? You know, in, in make include means exactly that. It's a, as if you copied and pasted the contents of the file into your make file in that case. Um, so let's see if that's what happens in build. So this is a kind of would be an equivalent uh, make file a uh, build file if we that's what we were doing so I just copied and pasted the contents of these two build files instead of include right straightforward stuff anyone sees any problem right that was quick well done <laughs> so the problem is that these targets are in the wrong directories right we are in the root of our projects this one belongs in in the hello subdirectory and this one is in the test so if you actually r try to run this you know you'll just nothing good will come out of it. You know, you, it won't find the source files for those targets. So it, it turns out that just kind of copying and pasting the contents, uh, the make style is not what build does. And what build does is has to do with directory scopes. Now, directory scopes is kind of a pretty fundamental shift from that standard make model. Bef up till now, we were just kind of tweaking it a little bit, but now we are going to really break it a bit. So in make, if you're familiar, every target and variable, everything is in kind of global scope, which corresponds to the current working directory. And unless you kind of specify the directory path to place it somewhere else explicitly in your, in your build file. In build, we have nested directory scopes. So what happens when the f initial build file is, is, is loaded, build automatically creates a, di a directory scope corresponding to the outbase and loads the build file in that directory. And then every time we include a build file, it automatically opens uh, a corresponding scope and loads the build file into it. So this is an example of, sc of kind of the, the scope structure for our example when we run build from the root directory. Now this outer scope is kind of system scope. It's always created, so it's the, the nothing can be outside it. And here we have a one level in, we have a scope for the root of our project, right? So this one was created by build when it just read the, the root build file. And these two, uh, they include scopes, scopes that created by includes. And now you can see that all the targets are in the right directories. Now this, um, this directory scope is pretty fundamental uh, kind of notion and can get a little bit hard to wrap your head around, especially when you start considering variables. But it's also the reason why we can write build files as if we are building in, in the current directory. And then amalgamate, kind of load them into much bigger dependency graphs using include and import, as you, as you will see later. And you know everything works. OK, so I've been mentioning that out of three builds. So let's go take a look at that how that works. So I have two compilers, Clang and G GCC on this box. So let's uh, build, make two builds for each compiler. Now we need to create the output directories. So I'm going to do that. Uh, we, we have to do it now, but I will see later actually build will do it for us in normal circumstances. We're going to still building up to the real world usage of build. So I've created these two subdirectories. Let's see our directory structure. So we have the source tree, right? Looks familiar in these two directories I just created. So let's uh, build first for Clang. Okay, so 
This is a bit new, but I guess all of you can guess, right? Specifying the C++ compiler. But what are we actually building here? Well, I think by now it kind of should flow naturally, right? We're building the output directory. So let's just punch it in there. See what happens. Okay, we get an error saying uh, cannot file, build file does not exist. Consider explicitly specifying SRC root for hello clang, which kind of makes sense. You know, we told build, hey, build me this, build me with clang in this subdirectory, but build what? You know, we didn't specify the source tree, and you know, we don't have any magic going on, so we have to specify it explicitly, which is done this way. If you have to kind of read it, then you can read it as build me hello in hello clang subdirectory. And now if we run it, it actually does the right thing. And two things to notice. Um, first of all, this test GCC, G++ line ch changed to test clang. Something's happening there. Somehow these two are related. And it also looks like build is building the output directories for us inside you know, our output directory. Let's take a look at the tree. Okay, so there is our source tree and now we have the output tree with our application, our test. So everything that we would expect, right? All makes sense. Everyone's kind of familiar what out of tree build looks like. You can also clean that. We know how to do that, right? Okay. Now if we look at the tree, again, seems like all those directories that were created were automatically cleaned up. And now this directory is empty again. So it kind of went full cycle. Uh, question? Because parenthesis is special in shell, interpreted special. Unfortunate, but what can you do? Oh, the question was, why do I have to quote? Use quotes here, and the reason is, if I don't, then shell will start interpreting it in its own way. Okay, let's try uh, GCC, shall we? Configuration. Turn verbose mode so that we can actually verify that GCC is actually used. And I'll use 4.9. I'll change here. Oof. Says so already clean. Makes sense. Okay, so there is the actual GCC 4.9 is being used. If we run 3 again, there is our now all our output in the the hello GCC. Okay. Oops. So that's out of three builds. We'll kind of get back to it a bit in a bit more realistic example. Right. Let's talk about configurations finally. Um, realistically, every project will have some kind of configuration, right? Even our first example, our first version of hello example had uh, one bit of configuration, and that's the C++ compiler that, that needed to be used. And the way it was working is a transient configuration was created every time we invoked build. And then the, all the operations that we requested were performed using this configuration, this transient configuration. Then it was discarded. So that test G++ line that we saw was exactly that. The C++ module was configuring itself every time by making sure that it actually has a C++ compiler and it runs. Okay. So this transient configuration is can be useful sometimes. You know, you, you just want to um, build once, you know, or ins build and install everything at once. You don't want to kind of create a persistent configuration. And this transient configuration pretty much free. There is no special code in build core that implements it. It's just a bunch of variables and kind of convention how to name them and how they override each other. But realistically, most projects will support uh, persistent configuration. And uh, that is implemented by the config module. So it's similar to C++. We have a config module. And you know, we pro it would probably make sense to um, you know, 
it, it's pretty fundamental thing, but we didn't want to uh, you know, break it into the build core in case someone else comes and decides to provide a different implementation. For example, someone want, may want to decide to store um, the configuration on the cloud instead of on the local disk. And most of you are probably thinking whether it's a really stupid or really smart idea. And my bet is that it's quite stupid. But anyway, so we, uh, all we have to do is, is basically, you know, use the, load the config module. And where do you think we should do that? Well, the root build file sounds like a good place, but this one actually has to be loaded in Bootstrap. And why is that? And again, I cannot explain it just yet, but I will in a few slides. So we load the configuration module and there's actually nothing else to do. We can actually go and play with that. Okay, if we run oops, build, huh. yeah, as you can see, so I ran build, I, I loaded this config module that should provide us persistent configuration and I run build, but it still prints this annoying line, right? Keeps printing it. Look at that. And also when we run clean, very annoying. But the reason for that is to actually create a persistent configuration, you need to, to do it explicitly. And the way we do it is we use the configure option. So uh, operation, pardon me. Uh, just a second. Okay. I was a bit surprised that it's uh, building all targets even as we are in the subdirectory. No, we are in the root directory of a project. There's a hello subdirectory. Ah, okay. So it's not in the okay. It's yeah. not the subdirectory within hello. Here we are. Okay, got it. So this is the directory we are in. Okay, so to actually create a persistent configuration, we do it explicitly and we use the configure operation. All right, so we still see the that first line, hopefully for the last time, and we see something different also. It was kind of sensible, something called config build seems to be saved. It's not right to build. Yay. The test G++ line is finally gone. You can also try clean, not test G++. If you want to kind of reconfigure our project, we can disfigure it. So we basically remove the configuration. <laughs> Again, seems to be doing the sensible thing. Let's try to configure it to, to use Clang in our persistent configuration. So now we are kind of getting closer to how you would use it in the real world. So. Okay, so test clang kind of makes sense. And now we build. Pause. There you go. Using clang, nothing is being tested. Notice that we also don't, didn't specify this config uh, CXX option. So it makes sense, right? You specify your configuration on command line, say configure, it's persisted in the output directory. Now you can just build stuff without any extra proposed stuff. Okay, let me try to... Let's go back to out, out of tree build and see how that works. Um, remember I said we, I created a directories explicitly and I said that we normally don't do that and th the reason for that is when you use persistent configuration, the build this configuration phase actually creates your output directories, right? So let's do our two configurations again. convenient to type standing. Okay, so we'll just configure two of them before we build anything. Four, nine. Uh, 
So now, now I, I created two configurations. Let's take a look at the directories. Right up there we have our source tree, and now we have two output directories. Right, some something looks like configuration stored there. There we have it. Okay. So now we can build it, right? We can, so for example, you can step into hello clang, just say V and it builds, right? Using clang. But I want to show you something much cooler than that. Who thinks this is cool? Do you see what? Do you do you do you see why it's why it's cool? Yeah. So we're actually building two configurations for the same invocation. It actually works. If you know, it's kind of a bit technical, but if you if you think what what this can do for parallel builds, I'm just gonna get to that. Um, you know, normally in make the way you would do it, you know, make. Uh, minus J, build one configuration, make minus J, build the other configuration. You know, every time it has to load all the, all the, you know, get the, all the modification times for that huge graph of all the same headers for both configurations. I mean, this is gonna, once the, the parallel builds are implemented, if they're implemented properly, this is gonna kick man, make spot pretty badly, I think. So, and the reason, and the reason why we, we can do that are those directory scopes. See, we have all these two output configurations, you know, they, they each have its own scope and they don't step on each other's toes, you know, they don't mess each other's variables, they kind of don't override each other's dependencies. Um, I'm gonna get back to you. And by the way, this, so we can actually say clean also. It also works. So this line, you know, this opera operations and targets that's in specify, and sometimes we specify, you know, operations and targets. That's a called called the build specification or build spec for short. Uh, so yeah, I think this is quite cool. Okay, I had a question. Can I write a build file in this directory that does all of this for me? So the question is, can I write the build file in this directory does it all for me. And the answer is, you will be able to. And that's, that is amalgamation. So that's, uh, you basically will amalgamate several sub-projects into, uh, into one kind of higher level project. So yeah, all right. Okay, let's just clean and disfigure everything. So I clean them and now I'm gonna disfigure. Gonna go the whole cycle. And if we look at the tree, so those directories are gone. So it kind of goes um, in a full circle, configure, creates the top level output directory and we build all the directories inside created as needed. And we clean those directories inside, get removed as if possible. And then once we disfigure then all that the top level directories are removed. So it's kind of goes full circle, nice and tidy. All right, um, so how this configuration is stored, probably the next question some of you might have. And uh, in, the, in this GNU make based build system, I was forced to use, to, to put configuration for each module into a separate uh, file and they spread into subdirectories. And that turned out to be a real pain because what happened kind of, you learned this from experience and what happened is I don't really often create configurations from scratch. What I do is I copy kind of close enough configuration, go and tweak a few things, you know, few compiler options there and there I have a new configuration. And doing that, if you have your configuration spread over, you know, multiple subdirectories, multiple files is, is, is a real pain. So this time, uh, configuration storage is very lightweight and simple. It's just a build file, a single build file with a bunch of variables assigned. So this is what it would look like for our 
um, configuration for Clang, right? Pretty simple. So how do we uh, specify the configuration? Well, one way we've seen already, right? Command line variables. So we can do something like this. The other one is you are free to edit that file. You know, the comment on this at the top invites you to edit it, you know, hack it, go for it. So copy it from another configuration, go adjust it, and there you have a new one. Um, third way that is not implemented, but I think it will be quite useful, is what I call a configuration in initializer. It's basically a list of keywords, a platform independent keywords from which uh, a specific configuration can be derived. So for example, you can say, you know, config shared release, and that will uh, build a shared library with suitable optimization options for your platform. You know, you, you never sp said, you know, O3 or, you know, dash shared option. So these are three ways, but kind of specifying configuration can be quite tricky. You know, some people might want a user interface. A uh, good place to learn from, the, uh, from kind of, from experience, it would be a Linux kernel configuration. Okay, so let's take stock of things to be explained. So we have operations and we, we have uh, the question, why do we have to load the config module in, in Bootstrap? And the, the cool thing is that they both relate, so we'll kind of tackle them at the same time. So I think by now you have pretty good intuitive feel for what configuration is, uh, for, for what operation is, and the kind of a mathematical notation would look something like that. You know, we perform operation on target that has a bunch of prerequisites. And these are some common uh, operations that we might have. Interestingly, quite a few of them come in the do undo pairs. What about configure and disfigure? Uh, do you think, are they operations? Uh, what are we really configuring? Are we configuring a target? You know, if you think about it, a bit, uh, it seems like what you're configuring actually is building a target. Or let's say if you want to install something, you're configuring installing a target, right? So let's say we have an executable, we want to build it, or we want to install it, and the configurations for these two uh, operations, they will be quite different, right? And sometimes I don't, I'm not planning to install anything, so I don't want to to do the configuration for um, install. So it seems like what happens is we actually configure is, an, is, a, is performed an operation on a target. So any idea what it would make it? Meta operation, right? <laughs> so that would be the notation. So we perform a meta operation, operation on a target. And again, this is kind of a very far departure from make model, where everything is a target. What about, is there something kind of deeper here? Uh, in particular, is there always a meta operation or is configure and disfigure somehow special? And again, if you think about it a little bit then, or a lot, like I did, uh, I would say there's always an operation. And when we do something like update or clean, what we have is kind of an implied perform operation. So we perform update target or perform clean target. And if you're still kind of in doubt, then dry run kind of for me clarified this point quite nicely. So it's a companion for perform, which would you know, kind of simulate performing things, but actually not do them. And then probably another meta operation or maybe meta meta operation is help. But yeah, I don't want to go into meta meta operations. So when we actually said build without any options, it was equivalent for build update, or it's actually equivalent for build perform update. Okay. So modules, um, there's actually quite a, only a few built-in operations and meta operations, and normally modules will add more. Uh, the restriction for such a module is that it has to be loaded in Bootstrap because that information is needed quite early. And that explains why we had to load config and bootstrap, right? Because it adds config and disfigure operations. Okay, I'm running a bit short on time, so I'm gonna rush through this a bit. To get a good feel for build system capabilities, uh, building libraries is a good test. It's quite a hairy problem, only probably rivaled by automatically generated source code. So let's take a look at that. 
So why it's here, for those who don't know, well, there's kind of a lot of little changes and variations that you might want to tweak or configure or adjust and getting it kind of in a nice clean way requires some effort. So we have static shared libraries and the build system. Some build systems only build one or the other for a specific configuration. Some of them build both. Both is kind of convenient and useful. Now, if you build a position, uh, a shared library in some platforms, you need to co compile your object files differently. You know, this position independent code. So that gets a bit messy because now, if you're building both libraries at the same time, now you need to compile the, the object file two ways and kind of make sure they don't step on each other, don't override each other. Then another problem is linking priority. You know, when you have both libraries available, do you link um, to a shared or static library? You want, sometimes people want to override it. So it kind of gets, a, it's like a lot of little kind of switches that you need to take care of. All right, so let's uh, make a library for our uh, hello example, right? The tree doesn't change much. We'll just put this into a library. So this is the build file, the old build file that we had in the previous version where we just built the executable. So now it changes to this, which is, we just built a library, again, very kind of similar. And now instead of linking directly, directly to this utility uh, source file, we link to the library and we add this default, uh, default directory target. Okay. Um, so this is our old build file for the test where we link directly to the source file. Now it changes to this, right? Anything missing? Someone sees any problems? Well, the problem is we, we don't have the dependent you know, dependency information for the library, right? If it's out of date or it's not, be it hasn't been built, then, you know, how are we going to build it? So we use our include mechanism, kind of the same building block to get it, right? Pretty straightforward. Okay, let's go take a look how that works. Okay, well, if you look at the tree, it seems like it builds the shared library by default. Right? You can confirm this, the 80s. See the actual commands being executed? There is that fpick option, and you can also notice that there is this dash sort suffix, which makes sure that, you know, we can build a normal object file as well. Let's actually see how we can do that, how we can build both libraries, right? So the way we do it, you can probably kind of guess more or less. There we go. So now we have the archive and shared and Notice that we compiled this utility twice. So one of them was for position independent code and one of them for, um, for the normal object file. Okay, let's do another test. Um, first we clean everything. Now we just go to the test directory, right? Uh, okay, I have a question. Uh, what if you want to compile your static library with um, There is a way. Well, the question was, what if you want to compile your static library with fpick? And the answer is, uh, there is a way to do it, but can I show it to you at the end of the talk? It's a fairly obscure feature, but it's possible. And fairly easy, actually. Um, Okay, so we cleaned everything, and now we went to the, so there's no library exists, right? And we went to the test directory, and we trying to build there. Okay, there are two interesting things here, what happens, right? Well, first of all, the library was built automatically. And that's kind of uh, an overall idea of this, you know, loading dependencies everywhere where you use targets. In, at no time should you be sitting and thinking, oh, I changed this here, there, so it, it affects that library and this library, so I need to go and rebuild them before I build my test. And if I forget, 
the, the, and I forget another library, then I get a SKU build. You know, this doesn't happen in build. You just go to what you need to build, and you run build there, and it will automatically figure out and update everything that, that, that it's needed. So that's one point. Uh, j just a second, coming back to you. Second point is notice, uh, well, actually, I'm cheating here a bit. So let me clean it and rerun it like this. So I'm, I'm trying, I'm building both libraries, but I'm building in test. In, uh, okay. Need to clean a bit more. So I'm building both libraries, but actually a shared library is built, right? And the reason for this, that for, for this executable, you know, by default it's linked to a shared library, and that's the only thing that is needed for this particular executable. So the static library is actually not built in this case. But if we go to the root directory and rerun build there, then only st uh, the, share, the static library and only the static library is, is built. So this might give an impression that there's like a lot of special, like a battery of special cases inside build to, to implement and support all of this. And actually, uh, there is no such thing. There is actually a very simple extension to the GNU make model that kind of from which everything flows fairly naturally. Those of you who've used make in any serious project probably know the uh, target group problem when you have a, a, a single command that updates multiple targets. In make it's pretty painful to handle. What we do in build, we say we actually have a special end, special kind of targets called target groups, which is essentially contain other targets which are called members. And the exact semantics of interaction between group and uh, and members is left to the target type. So it's kind of target type specific. And in our case, obj and lib are actually target groups. Object can contain a normal object file or position independent one, or and the library can contain a static or a shared library. Now, well, I should have said may contain, and the reason for that, that is that they only build if and when necessary. And so, for example, what does it mean to, to build a library? Well, as we've seen, that depends on the value of the config bin lib variable. You know, if you specified both, then both will build build. If you specified one of them, then only that member will be built. And what does it mean to link to a library? Well, linking to a library actually means uh, linking to a suitable member. And well, the question is, what, what is a suitable member, right? So let's see. What is the appropriate member to link? Let's say we want to uh, kind of fairly common uh, requirement is to build a both static and shared library, but link executables to a static library. Now, this is normally really pain in the butt to do, but, well, depending on the build system, but those that I have experience with were the case, but with build, it's actually pretty simple. So we just specify a link order for executables. And well, I should actually run it with all right. So we specified the link order and we said, you know, link our executables to static library, but we are still building both. So if you look, we actually do build both libraries. So there's a shared library somewhere there it is, and there's an archive somewhere here it is, and the actual our executables are both linked to the archive. Here they are. So in build, we have these uh, three variables that configuration variables that control the link order for li executables, libraries, and shared libraries. So that's actually pretty easy to do. Okay, I'm gonna skip through this. All right, so th this is probably the most interesting part of the talk. I have five minutes left to cover it. Um, let's say, you know, our hello library became so popular that it now makes sense to distribute it separately. 
uh, and so we're going to split it into two projects, right? We have the library, which looks a lot like our previous version, right? Directory structure-wise and content-wise, and we have a separate project for hello. We basically move this hello source code from the from this directory to there. So we now have two separate projects, and these are all the build files for the lib hello. They all nicely fit in the single slide, and there's nothing really interesting here. These are all the same. Here we just remove the building of the executable, and everything else is exactly the same. Um, hello project is where things get interesting, and nothing interesting really in the bootstrap or root file, so it got to be this line, right? Now I put this uh, library, you know, I want to, to link to this library, use it as a prerequisite, which is kind of what we've been doing, but uh, the question is, now, how is this library going to be found? Well, we kind of had the same problem, right, in our original uh, earlier versions, in our test. So there we did, what we did, we used the relative paths, right, and we included the build file. What do you think? Can we do this in, a, in this case? Can we use the same approach in this case? Well, the reason why not is because these are two separate projects. You know, they distributed they configured their build completely independently. We cannot make any assumptions that you know they will be next to each other. You know, this one might be on a completely different place. Or it can be installed. Who knows? So this is not gonna work. And so let's see how we can solve this. And one way to do it is to put the dash L linker option with our library and then into the CXX libs uh, variable. So this is the fourth variable for p options, c options, l options, and libs. And I assume that the, 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 pro, the library is installed, you know, where the compiler looks by default, like usr lib, for example. So that's one option. Uh, the other option is kind of to do the same first step, but then expect the user to supply dash i dash l uh, options, you know. Let the user deal with it. A third option, some of you seem to like it, you know, with Git modules is to bundle everything into your project, all the dependencies, to the point that, you know, your project looks like some other project because there's so many <laughs> source files from that. That's what I heard in one of the previous talks. Uh, and the fourth option is to actually have a proper dependency support, project dependency support at the build system level, and that's what we're going to do. I'm just going to dive in. So this is the build file that that tricky line that we just looked about at the hello build, the hello build file in our build and our hello application. It doesn't look very long, so let's just focus on the first line. We have the import, and after the import, we have the what looks like a lot like a variable assignment, right? And in fact, it is a variable assigned, but with a little bit enhanced semantics. So the idea is here that on the right hand side, we have a list of project names that we are importing. So the next question, next question is what does it mean to kind of import a project? And, and what, what, what gets assigned to a variable? So the answer is normally, well, it depends on the project. There's quite a bit of flexibility. But normally, what, what is assigned to a variable is a target, yeah, a leap hello in our case. But that's what we would expect. The other thing that the import project import should do is load the dependencies for this target that it's returning. So that's what happens, and but this understanding the last line probably makes a lot of s more sense now, right? So we got the lib hello target, and now we are going to use it here. Um, so who stands on the other side of this? You know, uh, is there some magic in build, some special code in build, or do we have to provide a build file, write a build file? And bad news is, yeah, we have to write another build file, and it's called an export stop. It's another special build file that you put in the build subdirectory. And here it is for our example. This is probably the most complex build file in the whole talk. So if you can understand that, then you basically understand everything. Um, export stops are kind of interesting because they run in, or they are, they are loaded in a, what I would call a no man's land. They are not in the importing project anymore, but they are not in the imported project either. In particular, an export stop cannot modify uh, variables of the importing project directly. 
So it has to use this import-export machinery to pass things around. So this kind of quite a bit of isolation between projects. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the import process performs two tasks. First, it loads the dependencies for the target and then returns the target. So the first lines, lines do that. Um, remember, we are in no, no man's land. So first thing we do, we switch the directory scope to the imported project. Right? This is an, uh, kind of an explicit scope switch. And then once we're inside this project, we use the standard include machinery. As you can see, you know, this include is used, it's kind of a really fundamental building block that is used in quite a lot of different uh, situations. And we don't have to reinvent something else. So these four lines load the dependency. The last line, I think, self-explanatory, right? We kind of return the, the actual absolute uh, path to the to the target, to the library. All right, let's see how it works. I think I, uh, I'll be probably done in five minutes. So if you bear with me. Okay, so this is our directory structure, right? So this is our application. This is our library. There is our export stop somewhere there. Okay. So we go, we go to our application. We just try to build it. You know, we're just being brazen, and we get an error, which basically says, "Look, I cannot find output root for the imported lib hello. You know, import lib hello, but I don't know where it is. Consider explicitly specifying uh, its out root via the config import hello command line variable." So not surprisingly, uh, you know. We say import on one side, and we have an export side on the other side, export stub. But who is actually going to find this uh, project, and how it's going to be found? Well, this explains how. You know, not surprisingly, we use the same configuration machinery. So you basically need to specify it on the command line. There are probably going to be other ways to do it, but this is kind of the most basic, most fundamental way. So let's give it a go. So I'm just going to do exactly what the error message suggests, and we specify lib hello. Now, I know it's, it's in the kind of sibling directory, but this could be somewhere completely different, right? OK, so that error is gone, right? Kind of got a bit further, but we got a new one. Kind of looks familiar, right? Again, you know, we our application includes this hello utility, but you know, there's no dash i option, compiler option. So how do we pass it? You know, we we just kind of pa we pass the, the the library target to link to, but it's not a, really enough. You know, we also need to know where the headers are. The way this is done in build is using uh, special export variables like a target specific export var variables. Think of it as a metadata that travels to get along with a target. So you set them on the target and they are essentially compiler options that, uh, that the importing project must use in order to successfully you know, link to the library in our case. Those of you who are familiar with PKG config, this is essentially the same idea, except at the build system level. So what we need to do is uh, add this dash i option to the exported p options. And there are two places we can do it. We can do it in an export stop, or we can uh, do it in the build file of the library. I like to do it in the build file of the library because it's kind of part of the library information, and you know, I like to keep things together. So once we fix that, let's go take a look. All right, and it works. Magic. So these are our dash i option. Let's try an out of three build, just for interest's sake. So what we're going to do is we're going to build, um, 
it's kind of a, also a little bit real world example. So we're going to build our library both static and shared, but we're going to build uh, we're going to link our hello example to to a static library, which is not the default thing. Okay. So first we're going to configure we're going to configure our library. All right? So we configured it to build both static and shared. And now we're going to configure our application to link to static. Yeah. The other thing that we need to specify also, remember we need to specify where our lib hello project is imported from. Okay, let's see if I got this right. Oops. Nope. Well, actually, it's actually in the directory right here. All right. So now I have a configurations for both. Um, well, that one you cannot see, huh? So we have a configuration for hello application and for our build. So now we just go and we build the application directly. You know, we, we don't have a library built, but we don't care about it. We just go and build what we want. And there you have it. it creates directories and it create, builds the library, static libraries you can see, and it links um, our executable. Let me just show one more thing. And that is, um, let's modify a header file in our library. It's kind of uh, a reality check. So the idea is that I'm, modif I'm, I'm interested in building this hello application. I'm modifying a header in some other library that is imported, which is what normally happens during development. And so I changed it, right? And now I'm going to re rerun it. And there, build knows that it needs to recompile the the hello application needs to recompile the utility class, uh, link the library, and relink the application. Yeah, Can you question. Touch the CXX file? Which one? The utility.cxx. Yeah. So, that's exactly what you would expect. Because now it doesn't need to recompile the the hello source file, right? Just compiles library, links library, links the application. All right, so that's imp project importing, exporting. Implementation details. I don't know if you give me five more minutes, I'll just finish everything. I don't know, up, up to you. Um, some of you may think, you know, who implements all of this? The question is, is it kind of all hard-coded in build? Is it like a C++ specific, you know, build system, you know, really kind of specialized for this task? And the answer to this is modules. Um, it's actually, build core is actually very small. And most of the logic is in modules. And a module can register new operations and meta operations. Like, for example, confi uh, config module registers configure this figure. It can register new target types. For example, a C++ module registers like CXX target type, which is C++ source file. Um, it can also register new rules. Now, I never mentioned rules, but rule is actually what does the job. And essentially, it's, what, it's the code that knows how to perform this meta operation on this operation on this target type. So just to give you an example, uh, a C++ module has two rules. One is how to link C++, uh, compile C++ files, and the other one is how to link, you know, executables and libraries from that. And rule is actually has a lot of, it's, it's actually very powerful. It has a lot of control how things are done, you know, how, how exactly things are built. 
So what is what is a module exactly? Is it like another build file or what, what is uh, what language is it written? It's probably the most pertaining question. It's actually a good one. So let's see what the requirements. Uh, we want a full real programming language. Right? You know, make experience showed us that trying to add a programming language later doesn't work very well. We want it to be cross-platform, and I'm talking about you know first-class cross-platform. I don't want to tell my users, oh, go install um, Iron Python on your Windows box to use my build system. It should work everywhere pretty much the same. We want it efficient. Build systems are probably very few things, very few areas or projects where you have to think about uh, performance uh, from the get-go. And you, when you have an update check, up-to-date check that takes, for example, several seconds instead of several mil milliseconds, it actually matters. You know, it, it starts annoying people. Well, in our case, we also want that so that most C++ programmers didn't have to learn a new language, right? It would be a nice feature. So any idea what language fits all this criteria? <laughs> <laughs> well, some C++ programmers might have to learn <laughs> some C. Right, you got it right. So modules are actually implemented in C++11 and um, Packages shared libraries, well, will be packaged as shared libraries to be more precise and loaded automatic, di dynamically by the build system. And as I said, mo modules implement rules and rules are pretty much, you know, they can do 90% of, of things. You know, they have very kind of great control of how things are done. Okay, state of the implementation, everything I've shown you actually works. It's not some stopped code, you know, just for the presentation. And I believe most of the kind of worldview, the model is established, uh, but it's still very early stage. It's kind of a rapidly developed target, and so alpha quality, and there's still quite a long ro road ahead. So some of the th next steps is amalgamation subprojects. You know, being able to compose projects, kind of copy one into another if you want to bundle the dependencies, the test and install operations. Um, automatic model, module building and, and loading. The idea is that I want, I want people to be able to distribute modules as source code and build system automatically builds them when necessary and packages them as shared objects and loads them automatically. Then we need to add support for another C++ compiler as a kind of reality check and Visual Studio is going to be the one to do that. Um, inline recipes, uh, the idea is that, you know, ru rule is it's kind of, you know, if you're familiar with make, a rule in build is equivalent to pattern rule in, in make. But sometimes you have this ad hoc kind of one target where you just want to execute a command. So there will be a, a way to do that, just kind of one command, no shell nonsense because it's not portable. But we will also may want to have, you know, a little uh, kind of C++ snippets embedded directly in the build files. So I think that would be cool. And there's no actually technical reason why we cannot do that. I kind of thought through that. Finally, parallelisms. Right now it's sequential and starting to annoy me because I use build for its own development and it's kind of growing. So it's taking longer and longer to build. So I'll have to address that. And that's it. Uh, this is the home page. Right now it contains the link to slides and to the Git repository, not much more. Uh, but yeah, you're welcome to check it out. Thank you very much. Sorry for running late. Cool. I don't know. Questions? So how long till it builds boost? <laughs> um, look, I, I mean, it might be, be be able to build boost now on Linux, for example, you know, using GC, G++. So you just have to be able to compile assembler. Assembler. Why would that be the? Because of context. Context assembler. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Question. So is this? Uh, uh, I, I saw it earlier you showed it had an MIT license. Is this source available? Yeah, yeah. If you go to this. Uh, page, it will be very short, and one of the links you will see immediately is a link to the Git repository, and everything is there. You support user-defined types? User def do I support user-defined in, in well, what sense? Yeah, yeah. Other cases? Module can register a target type. It's called a target type. 
and module can add its own. Like for example, C++ module adds this HXX, CXX, you know, all the source files for C++. Okay, another question. Uh, do you need help on some, any, like, is there specific parts that you're looking for help on in your to-do list that you have there? Um, look, you know, if you want to join in, just write me an email and figure out. You know, I, I believe that, you know, you should work on what interests you, not what people tell you to work on. So, you know, come write an email, I'll send you the list of kind of big areas that need working. If you fancy something, be my guest. Okay, question? So I'm curious how you chose to handle um, scanning for includes? Uh, yeah, that's, the question is, and that's a good one, how, how do I scan for includes? So basically, how do I kind of get the here, the dependencies? And well, I, for, for kind of nobody from Microsoft here, for sane compilers, that's easy, right? Um, that's uh, you just, you know, just dash M option or whatever, variant of it on GCC. And that, that's pretty easy. That's actually what the rule does. If you see, if you look into the code, it's actually, I mean, at first you'll probably think it's insane, but I think if you th kind of think about it, you will see that it's really cool. So the rule actually, you know, in, in make the way you do it, you kind of make it a, a, dip, a real targets and dependencies, and then you have problems, the file gets deleted. In build, you know, you don't have to do that. A rule can load, you know, can stash the dependency so somewhere else and keep it ca as a cache. So what happens now, again, it might sound insane, but makes sense if you think about it. Uh, build actually executes that, uh, uh, the, that rule that from the C++ module, it executes GCC with this dash M option on every vacation. So that it kind of builds the, gra uh, the, the dependency graph every time. Right, the only issue with that is that it requires the headers to actually exist, which means they can't be generated, which no. means it won't work for B2 headers. It's, um, GCC actually handles that. And yeah, I mean, so source source generate you know generated here this, and that discovery is a, is a nasty problem. I agree. That's probably <coughs> nastier than libraries. Yeah. Uh, and GCC actually does that pretty well. I and I kind of handled it in the previous build system because you have to keep calling it and as you build the headers. Mm, to look, the there, there's kind of heuristic that you know you know that this here that is generated and doesn't exist. You don't actually need to do it on this run. So you just kind of go and build the header. Right, but if it includes another generated header, <laughs> then we're <laughs> Yeah, some more thinking needs to be. The problem will be, you know, GCC at least gives you kind of uh, a bit of a, um, you know, it does the same thing. It doesn't, if, if the header doesn't exist, you can instruct it, just give me the exact path, you know, that, is, that, is, that, that it's included with. So that's why I like to include things, you know, with hello slash utility hxx, because yeah. then you can map these prefixes to, to targets, you know, that has generated. But what I don't know about Visual Studio is, you know, this, there is a way to ask it to, in, to output all the headers that are, that are in the file, kind of an include stack. I'm not sure what it does if it doesn't find the, a header. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it does something sensible, but if not, <laughs> it's going to be... Yeah, a big uh, a problem. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Is it self-hosted? Um, yes, I actually use it to develop itself. The kind of the problem is how to bootstrap it, and uh, yeah, right now you just have to compile it manually from the command line, and once you do that, uh, just stash the the known version somewhere so you don't override it because yeah can end up having to bootstrap it again. Okay, any other questions? All right, I think we are done. Dinner time. Thank you.